Uh, good morning, my name is Dan Nelson. I'm an attorney with Spencer Fame LLP. Uh, prior to that, I was a federal prosecutor for 12 years, specializing in accounting and fraud cases. Uh, following that, I was the chief deputy prosecutor of Jackson County for five and a half years. And uh, since then, I've been with Spencer Fame. Um, the investigation that we conducted on this case, I was joined by former Special Agent Randall Wolverton with the FBI. Uh, Mr. Wolverton uh, is a CPA and was a certified fraud examiner with the FBI for a large number of years. He specialized in accounting cases and uh, cases of exactly this sort. Um, beginning our investigation, we collected and reviewed a broad range of materials, documents, and records. And then Mr. Wolverton conducted an audit. Um, 24 witnesses were then interviewed once we had our audit findings. Uh, I'd like to say from the outset, no city employee had an advanced preview of the employment investigation findings, nor did they have input into the recommendations report, a copy of which will be provided today, or the PowerPoint summary report, a copy of which you'll also be provided today. So the materials that are in this PowerPoint will be provided to you um, when, this is, uh, when this is done. Uh, I'd also like to say, um, you know, in a compliment to the city of Independence, all city and police witnesses uh, were highly professional and very cooperative. Um, the city manager's office uh, also coordinated very aptly the um, giving of records to us at our request. So we'd like to thank everybody for their professionalism throughout this process. Um, first, uh, for today's briefing, I cannot comment on individual employees. So please do not ask me questions about the role of individuals. Um, those findings have been deemed to be a closed record. Uh, in the interest of public transparency, however, the City Council last night has otherwise authorized me to summarize findings for you today. Uh, what I'm presenting to you today is what I presented last night to the City Council. So uh, it won't have individual people's names in it because those are subject to, uh, that's employment data, subject to an employment investigation and with the possibility of litigation. Uh, so that uh, will not be released, but questions about that should be directed to the City Attorney's Office or to the City. Um, but again, I want to reiterate, nobody at the city was aware of these findings until last night. I apologize for that short notice on the, the uh, media briefing, but until the city council voted last night to authorize the briefing, they, uh, I'm told they didn't send out the uh, media advisory. So uh, over 14 months, every floor of the Independence Police Department headquarters had renovations. The total was approximately $398,000 in cost for those renovations. Police employees themselves provided 3,395 and three quarter hours of labor, all at overtime rates. Overtime rates for those laborers were approximately 1.5 times their normal police salaries. The labor cost totaled approximately $200,591.40. The median police hourly labor rate was therefore $60.59. The basement jail was 85% of this project. So there were re remodels on every floor, but the basement jail was 85% of it. Approvals. It's the conclusion of this investigation that a significant miscommunication occurred between the Independence Missouri Police Department and City Hall. Police told the city that the jail had life safety issues. The city gave an oral okay to fix the life safety issues at the jail. So it is a conclusion of this investigation that the city knew some renovations were occurring. Uh, police did not receive express permission to use police labor time. Uh, pardon. Police did not receive express permission to use police labor or overtime. But the city did not ask questions or follow up when told that renovations would be occurring at the police department and authorizing it. In conclusion, there were loose oral permissions here. And this investigation concludes that loose oral permissions sought or given are uh, unacceptable for construction projects for a city the size of Independence. Loose oral permissions sought or given for construction projects are unacceptable. This investigation concludes that police followed some, but not all of the city of Independence's procurement rules. The labor should have been bid out. It should have gone through a public bid process, and it did not. Police labor was not licensed, nor was it bonded or insured. And the import of that is it exposed the city to a great liability risk. Police failed to consider 
even labor costs in their total project cost projections at the outset of the project. They focused on materials costs, but they failed to include labor costs. The investigation concludes that an enormous amount of hours were certified as worked by the police laborers, but in fairness, this project was major and the laborers worked around their police duty hours. The police did not work. We found no evidence that police worked during their shift hours on the project. Annual reviews and interviews supported that the police laborers continued to successfully do their police work during the project. Police said they would use budget savings from detainee housing to cover costs. There were significant budget savings from detainee housing due to COVID because less people were getting arrested, less people were getting transported, less, pe less meals were being purchased for the detainees. Those numbers were down and those savings were real. However, there were no overall budget savings in fiscal year 2020 to 2021. Police had savings through both the detainee housing and they had even more savings through unfilled positions. As everybody knows, uh, Independence Police Department is down with several dozen unfilled police officer positions. But the police did not make their budget in fiscal year 20 to 21. They were $253,006 over. And in fact, in the overtime budget category, the Independence Police Department was over budget by $648,150 for fiscal year 2021. Now that wasn't due just to this construction project, it was due also to um, big, big overages in retiree health, workers' compensation, and that makes sense given the COVID environment that they were operating in, that they would have increased costs in those categories. Um, those two were also over by over 600,000. So it wasn't just the overtime, but this investigation concludes that the remodel contributed to the budget overage, although it was not the sole cause. It appears that police will make their budget for fiscal year 21 to 22. Those numbers are not final yet. I checked on them as, as recently as Sunday, uh, but they still anticipate that they will make their budget, including the cost of the overtime for the renovations in the 21-22 fiscal year. So these renovations went over both fiscal years, 20 to 21 and 21 to 22. Police said they would use budget savings to pay for the entire project. Police did not even make their budget, so there were no budget savings in 20 to 21, but it appears that they will make their budget in 21 to 22. For 21 to 22, however, uh, over time, including the labor remodel costs, is forecast to be approximately $600,000 over again. And that's a high number for both of those years to be over $600,000 in overtime. So that's a forecast for, for this year, but when the final numbers are in, that's a lot of overtime both years that they uh, are over. Obviously, not all caused by this remodel project, where the labor total split across the two fiscal years was only $200,000, but it still did contribute. Although police labor was inappropriately used, this project was well executed. And this investigation finds that it provided strong value for the tax dollars spent on the project. I'll say that again. Although police labor was inappropriately used, this project was well executed. And we conclude that it provided strong value for the tax dollars. Importantly, this investigation found no evidence of dishonesty by police employees. Although the hours could not be definitively verified, no evidence was found of fraudulent timekeeping. Secondly, no evidence was found that police attempted to hide the project from the city. I'm gonna answer some questions that uh, were subject to this investigation. Were the renovations necessary? Yes. Since 1972, the Independence Police Department headquarters has had very few updates. Uh, at the outset of this remodel, there were significant life safety issues in the jail, and we conclude that they were indeed ripe for staff and detainees. There was a risk of inmate suicide, and there have been some repeated issues where the configuration of the jail uh, posed a risk where uh, detainees could um, hang themselves or otherwise harm themselves. It, it was not modernized to, to modern standards. Uh, there were also poor security for the City of Independence employees who worked there. You know, the station was pretty 
uh, where the actual uh, guards were stationed, their workstations, there were two of uh, only two places with seats for them to do their job. And oftentimes there were four people back there. It just it had never been modernized for the independence's um, current needs. But in addition, the entire headquarters had numerous problems. Uh, there were leaking pipes. There were repeated issues of raw sewage, including raw sewage dripping onto people's heads while using um, the uh, restrooms. Uh, there was an incident with raw sewage going on to a captain's desk from the ceiling. Um, there were multiple issues with the building just showing its age, and it had not been updated in a long number of years. Um, there were also inadequate designs of the building that did not serve the police department's current needs. One example, they still had a dark room, and they hadn't been doing on-site <clears throat> photography development for a long time, but they had a terrible records room. They had a very dated uh, system for storing evidence and securing property. Um, th there were all kinds of uh, different problems with the sally port, uh, with security for inmates potentially being able to flee out of the um, garage when the, during the inmate transfer. Um, a lot of safety, other safety issues for both detainees and uh, configuration problems for the police department. So this investigation did not find that it was gratuitous or unnecessary, the remodels that were made. Did the city approve renovations at police headquarters? Yes. There was no documentation of this. It was verbal conversations only. And we find that there was a misunderstanding about the depth and breadth of the permission granted. In conclusion, police should have disclosed more. Police should have included the labor cost and cost projections. They should have bid the labor through a bid, a public bid process, which was required, and they should have stayed under budget. If a department head ships budget savings from one part of their budget to another part of their budget, the city's main focus is, are they still staying under budget? And here, the city of Independence uh, police department did not for fiscal year 2020 and 2021, although it appears even despite the renovations they did for 2021 to 22. We also believe, though, that there was a failure to supervise here, and the city should have asked more questions and followed up when told that police were going to conduct some renovations in the headquarters. What was the scope and cost of the remodel project? The total cost of materials plus labor for this project over the 14 months was $397,812. The remodel affected all the floors at uh, police headquarters, um, but the ground, second, and third floor remodel projects were relatively minor, minor compared to the basement where the detention facility was. So only 15% was um, <coughs> uh, of the money was spent on the uh, actual upstairs of the police headquarters. The rest of it, 85%, was all on the basement, which was the major remodel project. The projects upstairs involved moving a few walls that were non-load-bearing. They involved um, uh, providing a new conference room, an office for new staff, reconfiguring the dark room to meet the department's current needs, changing evidence storage, uh, updating the records department. But those were relatively minor projects and relatively minor expense compared to the major project that was undertaken in the basement with the detention facility. So that's where most of our focus was. Um, detainee housing savings may have paid for the materials used, and that was police's focus. Police were very focused on, have we saved enough through detainee housing to undertake the next phase by obtaining those materials for the remodel? But police ignored the labor costs and never factored those in. And then police authorized uh, overtime to be paid to the laborers from the police department who actually conducted the remodel at time and a half rates. This did contribute, we conclude, to the IPD budget overrun in fiscal year 2020 to 2021. Now, this investigation concludes that this amount of labor required city council approval and a public bid process because of the amounts of the aggregate labor taken in total were far over the thresholds that would require city council authorization. Police did not do so, but again, the city also <laughs> failed to adequately supervise, ask questions, and follow up about the scope and the progress of the renovations. Was the $398,000 remodel overpriced? We conclude no. This was a large, complex remodel project. Uh, police OT labor cost about $60 an hour on average, but 
this is the type of project that a major contractor would have to be hired to do. So comparing the $60 an hour to painters who charge 20 bucks an hour or you know, minor laborers misses what an architect would charge, which can be hundreds of dollars an hour. It misses what a project super can charge, which oftentimes is about 80 bucks. The police laborers wore all of the hats of an entire construction crew here, including those high-end parts. Um, also, uh, to the city's detriment, this project was not insured. Had a contractor been brought in, they would have insured the whole project, which would have created more costs and fees and having an outside contractor. Now, the city should have insured it, and there was a great litigation risk or liability risk through not doing so. But um, if, if we're looking at strictly the value of $398,000 for this remodel, our conclusion is that the, the work done on it was, was well executed. The work done on it was valuable for those tax dollars, although the process was not followed and that's unacceptable. Obviously no profit margin or fees were also included in this project. So, you know, you could normally expect a contractor on a project this size to include 7% fees on uh, materials and labor and uh, otherwise build a profit margin into the project. And that obviously was absent here, which was a tax savings for independents, uh, which was a savings for independents taxpayers. Was the police labor qualified? We find yes and no. We find that police had skilled talent capable of doing the job of an entire construction firm crew, but that doesn't mean it was a good idea. Police were not eligible city vendors, nor were they licensed, bonded, or insured. So again, that's a big liability risk to use uninsured labors. They didn't have a written contract even. Um, we also find that it was unfair to other City of Independence contractors who didn't have a chance to, a, to bid on this major uh, public works project. They were cut out of the process by Independence's decision to, uh, the police department's decision to assign it to their own employees. Um, we also find that Independence uh, Police Department disregarded or were, in at, were not adequately familiar with the city's own procurement process, including how aggregate amounts go over a threshold uh, requiring certain types of um, authorizations. Was it a violation of law or city policies to use police staff for construction? We find not in general. No clear policy prohibited the police department from using police for the construction labor. However, again, it opened up the city to great liability risk to do so. We also find that police previously did dozens of other in-house construction projects prior to this project. <laughs> We did not find any evidence the city ever complained about those prior projects. It's unknown how much they knew about prior projects at the police department, but um, this goes again back to the question of the supervision of the police department, specifically with respect to in-house construction projects. Um, police were not eligible city vendors, nor were they licensed, bonded, or insured, and procurement rules were violated for the labor, and that's why we say um, it wasn't specifically a violation of uh, independent city policies to use in-house labor, but it nonetheless violated uh, policies. Did police work all of the hours they claimed? Our finding on this is uh, not completely satisfactory, but the, our finding on this is that it is uncertain. The remodel project lasted about 427 days. The primary police laborer reported 4,870 hours during the project. For the number of hours he would uh, he recorded to have been correct, the primary police laborer would have had to work 12.4 hours per day for the 388 days that he reported working. That would include his ship time and his overtime on the construction project. With the available data, however, it appears to match or be close. This was an enormous complicated project. Available data corroborates that a huge number of hours worked but it's impossible to definitively validate his hours because uh, two, two issues. One, uh, police used four offsite locations for the build. So if time records and key card records did not indicate that given police laborers were in the building, that didn't mean they weren't at one of the four offsite locations or running errands to 
uh, obtain the materials. There was not a you know parts warehouse obviously out back, so every material put into this major project had to be obtained and and then utilized. Uh, the other thing that makes it impossible to definitively validate the hours, although they do appear to match or be close, we can't definitively validate the police labor hours today because IPD's uh, overtime reporting system relies entirely on the honor system. When sergeants or above sign off on a given overtime slip, the sergeant or above is not certifying that they have any personal knowledge of the overtime worked. They're merely certifying this person before me is reporting to me that they worked this overtime and I'm signing it. But it's entirely reliant on the honor system with no uh, ability to verify the quality of those hours worked. Why were so many hours required to work this construction project? Number one, the jail was occupied, so it constantly had detainees down in the jail during this period, and police did not want to shut down the entire uh, jail, necessitating moving all of those detainees off-site. Even though they were less than pre-COVID, there were still a lot of detainees down there. So they instead uh, built a custom modular jail off-site, and this was on a replica wooden template that they constructed, and they then fabricated the steel pieces one by one taking exact measurements of the space that the parts had to go into, including where every plug was in the jail, where every wire needed to go, where every desk needed to be, how big every chair could be and at what height. Uh, everything was completely measured out, and they constructed the jail, in essence, off-site, and then moved the detainees and constructed it, put all the pieces together in the jail to minimize the disruption uh, to the occupied jail. In fact, the uh, pieces did fit as designed, so that's one of the reasons why we say, you know, that it was a, a, a high-quality project and high-quality work product. Police, in fact, wholly designed and fabricated 148 custom steel pieces to exact specifications, including cutouts for the wires and plugs, and we found no evidence of waste, not a single piece that was wasted. I think one piece was damaged by a vendor, uh, and they replaced it for free. Uh, we didn't find any evidence that police... Um, wasted money through the project. They followed generally the City of Independence's guidelines in utilizing vendors and in um, obtaining materials. In fact, they solicited uh, bids or received materials from 51 different vendors. So there were a lot of moving parts on this major construction project for the police laborers who did it. Why were so many hours required continued? Uh, police did nearly all of the work themselves in a brief period. Police obtained nearly all of the materials required we took a look at the fuel records. The fuel records of the police laborers support the high number of hours worked when comparing those to previous years of the laborers. How much did they drive in previous years for just their work, and how much did they drive the next year with this, um, with this project? And the fuel records supported the higher number of hours. Uh, the remodel also required police to complete a huge amount of design, drafting, and prep work, um, including using CAD, uh, doing you know, each of those individual 148 fabricated steel pieces had to be custom designed and tested and retested. Uh, police were under instructions, we don't have enough money to waste steel parts, so don't bend the steel until you're certain that it's going to work. And uh, we didn't find evidence that they did waste any of those steel parts, but that um, would take a lot of measuring and a lot of drafting and a lot of um, remeasuring. Uh, we also found no evidence Police records do not indicate, and witnesses' uh, interviews did not establish any poor police performance as a result of the project. What was the incentive for anyone to work this many hours on this project? Well, independence is part of the Missouri Loggers pension system. Pensions are calculated uh, based on each employee's high threes, and that is their high consecutive three years in their last 10 years of employment. Um, overtime counts towards salary for loggers' pension purposes. So police laborers who worked on the project actually uh, will receive um, higher pension benefits down the road. Number two, construction had to be worked outside of core duties, nights, holidays, weekends. And one person did the job here of an architect, designer, superintendent, parts department, fabricator, and an entire construction crew. Now, a lot of the labor was uh, city maintenance was involved. City maintenance did approximately $8,000 worth of labor on this, of painting, taking up carpets, 
and so forth. A painting vendor who was approved by the City of Independence was used for much of the painting, especially in the detention area. Um, so there were subcontractors used for some of the more um, pedestrian tasks associated with the remodel. Um, but uh, obviously, um, the amount of uh, time that it took to work all those other duties outside of the core hours was significant. The project was conducted in phases, so there were also intensive deadline-based work associated to um, avoid delay. You know, anybody who had a home contractor or who had a project done at their home during the COVID era knows that getting somebody booked to come paint your house or somebody come fix something at your house um, or do especially a commercial project uh, you know, those people's schedules were pretty tight. In this case, there were so many phases to the project that, you know, in order for, um, for example, detainees to come back from Sugar Creek on Tuesday because Sugar Creek's kicking them out, uh, certain things had to be done to have the jail reprepped by Monday night or, you know, early Tuesday morning for that transport because the prisoner's coming back. If the person's coming to install the cameras on Wednesday, then overtime work needed to be done in order to prep the area so the cameras could be installed, because if the cameras can't be installed that day, it could be weeks before that vendor could come back. Um, so the project being conducted in phases was important, and, and we believe why we saw periods of very um, high numbers of overtime uh, in certain places. Usually those were associated with an upcoming deadline. Also, uh, an incentive to work this many hours on a project was to minimize disruption. So when the detainees were out, for example, they wanted to minimize the amount of time that the detainees were out of the jail and get as much done as they could while they were out. What was the impact of overtime use on the police pension fund? Um, as I explained, pension uh, in independence is based on the high threes, high consecutive threes in the last 10 years. Uh, we interviewed uh, somebody from Missouri Loggers about the impact of this for the taxpayers of independence. And they said for one person or a handful of people, there's economies of scale. You know, Independence is one of the largest municipalities that participates in the pension system. So uh, a few employees who have high numbers driving their rates up uh, for a given year or two um, probably isn't going to impact the contributions very much because of the economies of scale of their size of the city of Independence. However, inflation of salaries on a wider scale for the high threes could result in a much higher pension contribution. So if dozens or hundreds of City of Independence employees are trying to work as much overtime as possible and being allowed to do so by their supervisors in their last three years or the three years that they're calculating for their high threes, then that would result in much higher contributions for the taxpayers of independence. Recommendation. Uh, we recommend that a citywide audit of this issue should occur because the long-term liabilities here are potentially in the millions and tens of millions of dollars. So getting in front of this issue would be a really good idea for the city of Independence before um, what appears to be pretty common practice. I mean, people weren't hiding that they were trying to get as much overtime as they could while they were working their high threes. So, um, you know, questions exist about how widespread is this problem? Is this a small problem? Is it a large problem? And we think that that needs to be independently looked at by the city of Independence. Policy recommendations. Um, I will pass out today a, uh, a, a document that has the policy recommendations that, that Mr. Wolverton and I are making to the City of Independence. Um, in quick summary, I think I have three slides on the summary of the policy recommendations overall. Um, we recommend procurement training, um, staffing, and compliance. The procurement department right now has one of three positions filled and during this part. Prior to COVID, procurement had three employees. Um, during COVID, one of them was transferred and one person retired. So there was one person left in procurement, which is not very high staffing for a city the size of Independence and with as many facilities and uh, needs they have to procure materials. So there's a big question about how much auditing is even possible with one employee versus more reactive type work. So how much proactive can procurement do to make sure that city departments are complying with the policies and guidelines of the city of Independence? And we recommend taking a look at that staffing. Um, we believe they also should implement a compliance program and audit. Um, training has not been done uh, comprehensively man on a mandatory basis in the independence that we're aware of. The last optional training was in 2019 on procurement rules. We believe that uh, the city of independence should prohibit in-house construction projects. This is a liability. Somebody can get hurt and sue the city. It's both a liability for, you think about fatigue here for some of the labor, if somebody's submitting 
um, you know, that they work 21 hours or 20 hours, there's a lot of fatigue associated with that. And people doing a heavy construction project can injure themselves. And if they're not insured, licensed, or bonded, that falls squarely on the city of Independence, which self-insures. So we think that's an unacceptable litigation risk. Um, we believe the city should redefine projects, vendors, and cumulative threshold amounts in policy. Um, including reevaluate city purchasing and procurement policies. And we've made some specific recommendations that will be in the packet. Uh, we believe that the city of Independence should codify the role of municipal services. This is the entity that both is uh, responsible for the upkeep of the buildings and also normally coordinates with vendors who do construction projects on site. Uh, we believe the city of Independence should codify their role um, in overseeing construction projects. So there's a kind of a central place that everything is required to go through, not just expected to go through. Um, and then we also believe that the city will want to take a look at the staffing levels of municipal services to make sure that they have the correct employees and the correct resources. Um, you know, everybody's told to do more with less, right? But when we're talking about these types of expenses, you know, these are really important expenses that can result in cost to taxpayers if um, they're inadequately supervised. Uh, policy recommendations continued. IPD overtime vouchers. Uh, the Independence Police Department should implement a modern digital payroll system that links overtime records to work records. The IPD should ensure that certifying supervisors do have personal knowledge about the overtime whenever possible. Uh, we believe that IPD should also conduct regular interviews, uh, regular reviews of its overtime use, and set up a system of red flags and audit to make sure that when people are submitting over a certain threshold of overtime that it's being closely looked at and implications with respect to the pension program are fully considered. We believe that independence overtime policies um, in general should be looked at for the city of independence. Now, sometimes overtime policies conflict with existing work agreements, so it's a very difficult job for the city to try to come to a nexus of agreement with all the varying uh, affected labor organizations that contract, you know, that are in work agreements with the city. But we believe that the city of Independence needs to take a look at, to the best of their ability, implementing a clear overtime policy for all city departments. We believe that the city should consider hard overtime caps citywide. We believe that the Independence Police Department, uh, Independence Power and Light, and the Fire Department should examine their overtime policies specifically because they're the types of uh, public safety and, and disaster response organizations that tend to generate a lot more overtime. Most city departments have no need for overtime or, or very rare need for overtime. But these three public safety related departments and disaster responsive departments do have a high need for overtime. And it just needs to be looked at more closely and in including all the rules governing it uh, to make sure all the policies are modernized and uh, up to best practices. We believe the city should, as a whole, implement a modern digital payroll system that can red flag unexpected trends in overtime, and that the city itself should also conduct regularly um, audit and overtime usage. Uh, we believe that the, the uh, police department should take a look at officer fatigue considerations, and we believe that should be looked at by the fire department as well, um, including evaluating uh, caps on off-duty hours and overtime hours in line with modern fatigue studies. We've provided a um, IACP uh, Association of Police Chiefs um, study that we found particularly on point for this, and there's a link to it in the materials we'll provide, the report that we're providing. Yeah. Um, compensatory time and triple dipping with overtime. This is a problem, and we believe the city should institute a policy to prohibit this practice. Um, what that means is if an officer... Um, earns compensatory time for working outside of their regular duty hours, they earn that time at 1.5% their salary. If they then turn around and take that comp time to work overtime, they submit approved accrued annual leave and they work overtime with their comp time, they're effectively making triple salary. They're effectively making triple salary. We believe that the city of Independence should prohibit that practice. Pension padding. We believe the city of Independence should try within its existing work agreements um, to limit the ability of employees to seek disproportionately high overtime during their final three years of employment. 
And at this point, um, I'll uh, take questions. The answer to a lot of the questions, maybe I can't answer that because you're asking a question about an individual person or an individual's role. Um, but uh, I'll do my best. Have you ever seen something so poorly mismanaged? You use the word failure, unacceptable, inappropriate. In all your years of studying this and prosecuting, have you ever seen, seen something this mismanaged? I'm going to pass on that question to ask for my personal opinion. Mr. Bakker. How, um, how can you determine that there was strong value for the taxpayers by having the police laborers without any comparable bidding? I mean, I know you estimate some hours, but this also took a long period of time to have the police laborers do it jobs, whereas a construction crew, this would be their full-time job. Can you walk us through how you made that deter determination? That's a good question. The question is, um, how can we say that we believe or we find that the taxpayers got good value for their dollars in on these uh, projects? Um, number one, we took a deep dive into what the actual projects entailed, and they were really substantial. This wasn't throwing some paint up on a wall and, and moving some non-load bearing walls around. I mean, this was reconstructing and custom fabricating a custom jail offsite, which is the best practice and not something you can even get a lot of vendors to necessarily do because it adds a lot of extra steps and um, it's, it is a best practice to do that when possible to minimize operational disruption, particularly in a, in a jail facility. So um, that was persuasive, just the scope of a rebuild on this, um, on this uh, scale. Uh, second, we found that it was not a frivolous um, rebuild, that people were in danger, problems were occurring, uh, that the jail, uh, the detention facility specifically did present a clear and present danger, not just to the detainees, but also to the employees of the city of Independence. So um, uh, that it wasn't something that deferring forever, it had been a problem for a long time, and um, it wasn't something, though, that should have responsibly been kicked down the road. Um, three, uh, I did not, I was not authorized to, and I don't, um, I did not go ask for it, but we could have hired. The only way to really do this would, A, for them to follow the procurement guidelines and actually solicited bids in an open bidding process. And then we would know the answer to your question, um, but uh, they did not do that. So um, we're left to speculate. I did consult with a uh, contractor unofficially and just say, this is what was roughly done. Um, and, and what would you expect the fees uh, to be given the work that was done? And the estimate I got was they expected that it would be at least 30 or 40 percent higher. So that's just napkin math. That's not a satisfactory answer to your question. Um, but I, I do believe that just the amount of work done and the cost at under $400,000 and the promptness and the minimal disruption caused to the facility um, and the attendant cost that the city should have had to pay for it, but didn't have to, like having it insured, like building a profit margin in. I, I believe that common sense when looking at the whole scale of it says this was a good price. Yes. Following up on what Bakrat asked, I think most of your data shows that most of those costs came from the labor. And the city has previously said that maintenance staff could have done it for materials alone. So with that in mind, does it really make it a good value for the taxpayers? We're being asked if maintenance staff could have conducted this project. We conclude no. We conclude maintenance staff did not have nearly the staffing and the training levels for people. There was nobody there who could custom fabricate steel pieces and actually design, do the CAD drawings to design all these parts. Um, city maintenance is more associated with laborers who make about $20 an hour, um, who are on payroll staff. They were utilized for about $8,000 with the labor on this project, but that... Um, our uh, interviews established that even from people within city maintenance that they could not have done this project. Um, was this a pattern in practice that had happened over decades? Was this something that had happened before and why was the pattern in practice uh, to, to do police work at uh, construction work at police headquarters there? Why was that uh, sort of baked into the process? Um, Mr. Fleener asked if uh, this is something that had been occurring for a long time, that is in-house construction projects at the police department. Um, we found good evidence. Uniformly, everybody said we've been doing this for, you know, 20 plus years. It may have gone back farther than that. And if people uh, do a survey of media stories around the country, there's oftentimes stories about a fire um, captain who's really good at construction, you know, is asked to to fix the 
break room or to, you know, do work to make the station safer. I mean, but a city the size of Independence and with Independence's resources that are spent on these matters, you know, the taxpayers should have insured work done pursuant to a written contract, and that's what city policy requires. I, I, th I believe here uh, that the scope of this is what was completely different from prior projects. This had been done for, you know, the police laborers had provided dozens of these projects before over the last 25 years that kept coming up and everybody knew about it. Um, it's unclear how much visibility the city had of those projects, although I believe there could be a failure to supervise there and that should be carefully looked at. You made clear you cannot speak about individuals, but as a whole, is the city lying when it said it did not know about the bulk of the projects outside of those life-saving changes? Um, regarding uh, what the city knew, um, I'll refer to my PowerPoint and to statements from the city. I've talked to everybody that I, I believe that we needed to talk to for our investigation and that information related that's been provided to the city council. When you talk about yes, the value for taxpayers, are you including the cost of the materials in that? Were those bid out? Were those sales tax exempt? Were they bought from certified vendors of the city? That's a very good question. He asked if uh, when I say that we concluded that it was a, a fair price or maybe even a cost savings uh, the way that this went out. Bad idea, good result. Right, bad idea to do this uninsured and to use not go through the the um, bid process. But they got lucky here, and the end result for the taxpayers will serve the city of Independence needs in our estimation. Um, and uh, the materials cost, we believe that they followed protocol with respect to the materials. They, you know, viewed this as a uh, ongoing series of of, of projects as opposed to one single project, which was the correct lens, we believe. We believe the scope of work should have been performed. We believe cost estimates should have been provided for both labor and materials, and that just wasn't done here. There was no authorization to use a single source labor vendor, uh, labor vendor, um, so they didn't follow city policies on that. But with respect to the cost of materials, yes, uh, we found the police actually followed uh, city policy pretty well with obtaining those materials at using authorized city vendors with the applicable discounts and the sales tax benefits, and in fact, uh, traded a little bit on goodwill of the public and independence towards their police department and obtained some materials that um, were, you know, either gratis or, or discounted. Yes, sir. I'm not asking you to comment about specific employees, but who should independent city taxpayers hold accountable for this? Is it the police command staff, or is it city management staff, or is it both? I'm not going to make a conclusory uh, comment. I think that's a little bit beyond the scope. Um, uh, for me to make a generalized comment. I provided the materials and all of our findings, um, both through summary here and uh, to the, uh, the people's uh, elected representatives in, in with more detail, including all of that employment data. So I believe that you know, the, the taxpayers will have a voice in deciding whether or not it was acceptable and who um, should be held accountable. Is there a weight on who's more at fault here, the police command staff or the city management staff? I think I'll let our, our findings speak for themselves. Yes. You spoke a bit about triple dipping. Does that just apply to the police department? Or is that, you mentioned that should be a citywide audit. And can you elaborate more on the cost that may have been poured into that over the years? Because I think you said it was in the tens of millions. I, I would say when we talk about triple dipping, what I'm talking about is the earning compensatory time to then turn around and submit it as leave. And on the same day, working overtime, which results in 1.5 times salary for the compensatory time credit earned and then 1.5 times for overtime on the back end. Um, that was not a major, uh, I will say that was a very minor situation here. We did not find evidence that police laborers in this case were earning um, uh, earning compensation time at 1.5 and turning around on the same project and submitting it. But we were alerted that there was, you know, it was a red flag that there's not a city policy prohibiting that specifically. And some comp time was submitted here and worked as overtime. We just determined that it was previously earned comp time as opposed to um, earning project, uh, earning comp time on this project, turning around a week later and submitting it for overtime on the same project. Yes. They were earning overtime in weeks when they did not work 40 hours because of vacation and other leave. That's correct. They were earning, uh, they were submitting overtime in this case, um, uh, you know, in, including in some weeks where they may not have hit a 40 hour per week threshold. Do you have any idea how much that practice would have driven up the cost of the labor here? 
I don't think I'm in position to be able to answer that question, but I've provided a lot of materials in that vein to, uh, to City Council. Dan, you, you provided this idea of pension padding, or you sort of brought that up. Did you find evidence, or, or was there witness interviews to really corroborate that fact that there was some pension padding going on here? Um, Mr. Fleener is asking about uh, whether there was pension padding here and um, uh, what, what kind of problem was. Uh, the term pension padding is pejorative and presumes that there's a policy against doing it. I, I think the absence of having a policy is making a determination about, you know, how seriously the city's taking it. The city now has a, you know, a red flag that this is a problem. And, and uh, I believe the city is very earnestly trying to shore up its policies here and that <coughs> supporting an independent investigation here to get unvarnished findings with nobody getting an advanced peak or a chance to influence it at all. And I'll give the city all the credit in the world for that. They made everything available. They let us do our investigation. Nobody at the city knew anything about it until last night. But you found this was a practice, right? But, but I believe citywide there is an issue with pension padding and independence. I don't believe that it's prohibited. And I believe uh, supervisors generally you know, are signing off on time that has the effect of a certain individual in their last high threes, uh, you know, being able to bump their salary up in order to um, earn a higher pension. Can you walk us through your determination on how you say this overtime, this extra work, had no effects on their real duties as police officers? officers. Um, what I talked about with uh, police performance with respect to how could, uh, you know, what evidence was there, right? I'm limited to evidence that I can find. Um, what evidence was there that police... Um, gave short shrift to any of their official duties. Um, reviews were strong. Uh, none of the witnesses that we interviewed about this topic had examples where they thought somebody was unavailable. Um, people that worked on the construction project were still doing their call out duties. They were still taking overtime shifts um, to uh, cover for departments so that independents would have enough uh, police cars for a given night to meet all their staffing needs. During this COVID time, it was pretty wild just to meet staffing for Independence Police Department, especially when they're down dozens of police officers. Because if you have a whole unit that gets taken out and has to quarantine for two weeks, which was mandatory for a long period of time, just an exposure, they're doing two week quarantines. You have to give other people overtime if you don't give them at least two weeks of um, advance notice for duty reassignment per their work agreement. Right. So if independence has to move somebody to cover somebody who's out um, because of uh, quarantine or they have a covid uh, infection, you know, it's very expensive to backfill and cover that on the back ends. And we found that the the uh, police laborers themselves were still remain very dedicated in taking those shifts and, and doing their core uh, work functions. And we found no evidence. We found nobody criticizing individual laborers um, at all with respect to their uh, police duties. And we found that their ratings were still. You, know, you said, you said there was strong high. value for the taxpayers in this, but we have a city that's over budget. We have overtime policies that made the police department go over budget. You have police officers making over $165,000 a year, and the medium income just surpassed 50000 in this city. So when you talk about strong value, what are you saying to the actual hardworking people that live in this community? I think it's a very good question. When I talk about strong value, I'm limiting that comment and observation to the $400,000 of work done and charged for the jail renovation and for the renovations at police headquarters. I'm not making a comment more broadly, including was there a cost for independence not having policies on point that would have regulated some of these um, activities and perhaps, you know, the city council of having a chance to weigh in on whether this was the year they wanted to authorize such a big expenditure for a detention remodel when it looked like there were gonna be overruns in other categories. And you said by your estimation, after a citywide audit, this could cost the city tens of millions of dollars. Things, practices of these nature, of this nature. I, I'm not sure that I understand what you're referring to. So the cost of, of, of this work and what's been done over a long period of time could outweigh the cost that you laid when out I talked today. about um, high con. When I talked about what cost to the city, uh, you know, there's a lot of different troughs about different associated costs. When I specifically said a potential for tens of millions of dollars of uh, liability, uh, I was talking about the pension padding. If, if multiple departments allow dozens or more, if it's just common practice that every retiring senior person at the city of Independence, their supervisors sign off on them to have a high amount of overtime in their last three years, that has real results for taxpayers down the road. Yes. I know you mentioned that the city had a litigation risk by not insuring this project. 
but were lives put at risk considering there was electrical work and things like that being done without permits? Were lives put at, were at risk by the police doing this project? No, Our, we, we believe that lives were not put at risk. Um, for most of the electrical or all the electrical work, either in-house qualified people with in, the city of independence were used or subcontractors were used. So um, with electrical specifically, we didn't find evidence of uh, risk taking. Um, and, you know, the biggest risk was somebody dropping something on their foot probably, or, you know, it, it wasn't like a wall was going to cave in on somebody. But um, we still think that it's, uh, especially when you, build in the fatigue factor, somebody really could have been seriously injured and, and had a, you know, a workers' comp claim or a claim against the city. Yes. Follow up on Jessica's question, could lives still be at risk? We did case? not. That's a good question. Um, I'm asked uh, whether lives are at risk because of the construction project. We found that the, the construction project had high quality work. Excuse the me. Uh, city asked, oh, yes, ma'am, one moment. The, the city did ask inspectors to come in after this happened, and the inspectors looked at everything and um, uh, did not identify significant issues. There were a couple minor issues that were remedied. Yes, ma'am. Did your findings um, break down where the budget, where this was paid from? The citizens voted for a capital improvement uh, tax. The citizens have also access to the public works, CIP, capital improvement projects, where they can see where the funding came from. Did your report break down which department uh, in the police department, which budgets they came from, so that the citizens can have total access and understanding how this occurred? Yes, ma'am, and we believe that the, uh, I think my PowerPoint it contains a slide stating it, but the, the uh, police labor was submitted and paid through the general fund. How many officers worked on this project? Um, I'm not going to comment. I think that's an, kind of an individualized question. But a, a number of police officers worked on the project. Can you say if account, people need to be held accountable, or you won't comment on that? I'm, I'm not going to comment on uh, the bigger issues. I think that we provided the information to the city, and I believe the city is earnestly invested in reacting to it. They earnestly solicited the information. We're completely open to receiving it. I believe that they will make some changes. Um, in line the, with the public's expectations. I certainly hope that's the case, yes. You made it very clear that there are a number of policies that you recommend be implemented to mitigate all that's been going on here. Do you anticipate an uphill battle with the city when it comes to the unions? I can't comment or speculate as to future disagreements or, or agreements between the city and, uh, and its unions. You know, I would certainly hope that everybody would be open-minded to making um, changes that could be better for the taxpayers and independents. And, and not just say, you know, what we've done in the past is what we need to do without reevaluating and seeing if there's a better solution. I'll take one more question. Yes. You said you weren't assigning blame or more blame one way or another on this, but did you see at least a severe breakdown of communication on both sides? I did see a breakdown in communications on both sides. I believe the city should have asked far more questions, and I believe the police department should have provided far more information in advance. Um, with that, I'll conclude the press briefing. Thank you very much. Again, I'm sorry that we were 10 minutes late uh, getting started due to technical issues. Um, I do have uh, Mr. Wolverton's in the back there. Um, under the flags, um, we have, well, does he have the materials? Okay, so we have um, a report, which is a recommendations report. That's the same report that we provided to the city council um, last night. And then I have a copy of the slides, the PowerPoint slides from today. Thank you very much. The mayor will make a brief statement. We also have emailed all of you the PowerPoint slides and that report on um, recommendations. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Roy Roland. I am the mayor of Independence. And I always ask the question, will you spell it for you? Sometimes that's a question. Everybody's good on that? All right, very good. Um, and then uh, I'll make this statement. My goal is to change the culture of this city. I am beyond disappointed with what has happened, and I feel the outrage of the citizens. When I walked door to door, I heard this message many times. They were very upset that this had occurred in our city. As a resident myself, I share their concerns, and I expect more from our city. 
our city is in the news far too often for the negatives and not enough for the positives that we have going in our city. I have since, excuse me, I have said since my first day in office, we cannot manage a secret. My colleagues and I are closely reviewing results and the recommendations of this investigation. And we will take steps to ensure that this will never happen again in our city. We look forward to the proposed policy revisions from our city manager and the staff in the next 60 days to address the gaps within our policies and procedures in our city. To our residents, I hear you. We cannot manage the secret, and we will not let this culture continue. We will take the appropriate steps so that this does not happen again in our city. Thank you. Can we take a question, Mayor? Please? I have one question. Should, should people be held accountable? He said, Dan Nelson said that there was, this was unacceptable, inappropriate, there was failures. Should people be held accountable for this mistake, for this mismanagement? That's a great question. However, from my position as the mayor, the only person that works for me or works for us is the city manager. So should he be held accountable? He's the CEO he has of the to city. make recommendations to what's going on there, but I cannot talk about the, you know, the HR issues with regards to the employees, and 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 you know that coming in. But so. should people be held accountable for this? I mean, this is the taxpayers here that got the short end of the stick. Yep, we just got this report last night. We just got this slide deck that you have right here. We voted to give you that. And we want to work going forward to make sure that we make positive change to this city. We're so I really can't answer your question because that's not under my purview. But what is under my purview is making sure that this doesn't happen again and that we have policies and procedures in place to run the city in appropriate fashion going forward. Go ahead. Will you commit to making a full report redacted, published to the entire city? Will, will you commit to that? I'm not at liberty at that because that is, that is, that is a question for our city attorney. Do you agree with the uh, special counsel's conclusion that there was strong value for taxpayers with how this project was carried out with the lease? So your question was, do I agree that there was strong value for the taxpayers' dollars, basically the question you're asking? Yes. Um, we just got the report last night. I cannot come to a conclusion on that in you know less than 18 hours. How can the taxpayers the trust that you guys are going to make take these recommendations into consideration when he said there's a pattern over decades of you guys just doing what you want pretty much and with as far as overtime working, police officers not doing police work but remodeling work when there's a pattern of this, mm -hmm. how can the taxpayers trust that you're going to take these recommendations? That's why I ran. You know, and you and I have talked about this a number of occasions, I ran to change the culture of the city. Did I know there were problems? Absolutely. Was I aware of it? Yes. Did I want to see it change? No question. Will we work hard to make that happen? Yes, we will. I've already done that, and my colleagues in the council have seen a number of proposals that I've had in order to change the culture of the city, and that's what we're going to work to do. Yes, ma'am. You did say that you're beyond disappointed. What from these slides are you most disappointed in, and, and who are you really disappointed in? I'm disappointed about the whole thing. I'm disappointed that it happened. And, uh, uh, and and my colleagues share the exact same thing. I know I've talked to my other colleagues on the council and they're concerned with it too. But when we got the presentation last night, we voted immediately to release this in order for transparency and clarity for you and for the citizens to be there. And I'll take one more. Mayor, are you satisfied with the, that, that you got the value um, the council has authorized spending up to $100,000 in this investigation. Were your answers, were your questions answered? Are you satisfied with the information you've received? Again, just got the report last night, this presentation. I need to study it. We need to talk um, amongst ourselves as a council. What do we need to do next? You know, that's, that's a difficult question to say when you've got it, you know, within 18 hours. In terms of accountability, what are the steps toward accountability that need to happen Moving well, for us as a council going forward, we have got to change the policies and procedures in this city, no question. And if we don't do that, then these failures will continue. The 
responsibility is on us. The accountability is on us to move these recommendations forward in order for this city to be improved and to grow as we want it to grow going forward. These are the kinds of things that have held us back, and these are the reasons that I wanted to take this job in order to make these kinds of changes. So with that, I'm going to...